delighted by the presence of each and every one of you this morning, and I encourage you to be taking out your Bibles and following along with me to test the things I have to say to see that it be by the Word of God, and I hope that we'll find it to be the truth that will stay in life for every moment of life. Now, we can leave here being better servants of God in the future than we have in the past. If you were to uh, go around this morning to different churches, and I'm not just talking about churches of Christ, but going around to some denominational churches or going around to institutional churches. You would go through and you would find some things in many places that ought not to be a part of worship. You would go somewhere and you might see something like the use of instrumental music. Or churches having their worship yet having recreational activities. Perhaps instead of congregational singing, you'll see a choir arranged at the front. And you could see many such things as these. And when you walk in and you see these things, the thing that's going to cross your mind is, that's not supposed to be part of our worship to God. That's not something we ought to see when we come together to worship God. That's not what the worship that we find in the Scriptures. And it's not. But you see, sometimes what we need to consider is not just the things that we see that shouldn't be there. But sometimes we should consider the things that aren't there that should be. And that is, there are some things you might go to find people together who are going to practice the right things, teach the right things, and yet there may be some things lacking at services. Over the next few moments this morning, I want to consider some things you might be lacking at services. You Maybe you go around to a service somewhere, and when you walk in, there are some things that ought to be there that perhaps you just do not find. And so for the next few moments this morning, I want us to consider three things you might find lacking at services. Number one, one thing you might find lacking at services is you might find that everyone's presence is lacking. One would expect if you were to go somewhere for a worship service, to see all the members, or at least everyone capable of being present at worship services being there. That you come to worship services and, and you come there and you and you look around to see people there and you expect to see all the members present, at least those who are capable of being there. And this is not an unreasonable expectation as God demands that we come together. In Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse 25, verse 24 beginning, back up into verse 24, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's not unreasonable to expect that you go somewhere and that you find the members present, because God demands that we not neglect the meeting together, Hebrews 10, and in verse 25. This is not unreasonable. Yet you might go somewhere, you might look around, and as you begin to look around, you say, well, I don't see somebody that I know goes here. Maybe they're sick, and then you find out they weren't sick. Maybe they're just, maybe they're gone somewhere. Maybe they're out of town, but then you find they're missing for reasons well within their control. And then you go somewhere and you say, well, what do I expect to find? Well, I expect to see everyone in there. You might find everyone's presence lacking when you come together. You might go somewhere and say, everyone's not present. Everyone that could be, everyone that should be here may not be present. And so you go somewhere and you say, what do I expect to see? I expect to see the members and yet they're not there. You might find some lacking. Now, I know we went through that rather quickly. I said there's just three points. Don't worry, I'm not going to be done in five minutes. Uh, we spent a great deal of time dealing with this just recently, and so we won't go into any great detail with it because we've dealt with attendance here not all that long ago. Uh, but it is something we need to consider. That if you're coming here, you expect to see every member that can be present. If you visit somewhere, you expect to see every member that can be present. And that's not unreasonable. Yet when you go places, you might find that not everyone's presence is there. There's some people's presence. Lacking. Some things you might Lacking in worship services. You might find everyone's presence lacking, but let me tell you, you might find that everyone's participation is lacking. Now, before we get into the participation part, let's understand this. There are certain acts of worship given in scriptures 
We said earlier, maybe you go around to church and you go to a denominational church or an institutional church and you go in and see what they're doing. And you find things contrary to God's will outside of the things He told us to do in worship services. And we know that because the Bible gives us some certain acts of worship that will be there. There are certain things that God demands to be part of worship and needs to be part of worship. Number one, partaking of the Lord's Supper needs to be part of our worship service. Go to 1 Corinthians 11. You're very well familiar with this passage. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning at verse 23. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning at verse 23. For I received from the Lord that what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. And so, we're supposed to partake of the Lord's Supper. Here, after we finish the sermon, we'll have an invitation song, and then we'll sing a song in preparation, and then we'll, have, we'll partake of the Lord's Supper here in just a little bit. And so, we're, that's part of our worship service. It's commanded, 1 Corinthians 11, that we partake of the Lord's Supper. Not only are we commanded to partake of the Lord's Supper, we're also commanded to give of our meat, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, beginning at verse 1, Paul writes by inspiration, saying, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there be no collecting when I come. And so according to 1 Corinthians 16, we're to lay by and store up on the first day of the week. So after we partake of the Lord's Supper, uh, it'll be reminded we have the, the plates that are, still in, uh, that are in the back, and then one can give on their way out. We're supposed to be giving on the first day of every week, per 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, as well as 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 would point out as well. And so we, when we come together to worship, God demands that we partake of the Lord's Supper. He demands we give of our means. He demands that there be some preaching and teaching. If I delay, you may know how to behave himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth, 1 Timothy 3 and in verse 15. The church is the pillar and the buttress, or the pillar and the support of the truth. The, the, the church is to be, and the worship is to involve some evangelism. That's what we're doing right now. There's some teaching going on. right? There needs to be some teaching taking place in our services. Uh, that's supposed to be part of our services, 1 Timothy 3 and in verse 15. Prayer is to be part of our worship services, Acts 2 and in verse 42. Acts chapter 2, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Now the context there, the breaking of bread, Acts 2.42 is the Lord's Supper. And then there's the teaching together. They're having fellowship with one another, and they're devoted to prayer. This is part of their worship together. It's this prayer that's to take place. And so prayer is part of worship and then singing. As we've already seen this morning, a, uh, a few songs, Ephesians 5.19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. And so God demands that that be part of worship. God demands that this be a, uh, what we do in worship. We partake of the Lord's Supper. We give of our means. We engage in evangelism and have teaching and preaching. There's prayer that takes place. There's singing that takes place. That's part of worship. And as we said earlier, as we introduced this, you might go somewhere and find something that's not on that list. You might find something like recreational activities or we're going to send the kids to the gym and have a ball game, or we're going to share in a common meal together, or, or uh, in our fellowship hall, or we're going to have uh, a, a band play, or we're going to have instrument music. You may find some of that stuff. And then we're all concerned and raise red flags, and, and we should. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying we shouldn't. We should be concerned about those things. What I'm saying is we need to consider the certain acts of worship given, partake of the Lord's Supper, give our means of evangelism, prayer, and singing, and then consider the fact that God demands that we be taking part in these acts of worship. He demands that each and every one of us be taking part in these acts of worship. For example, we need to be focused during the Lord's Supper. Go to 1 Corinthians 11 again. 
How do we take part in each of these parts uh, of worship services? How do we take part in worship services? Well, when we come to the Lord's Supper, we take part by remember by not only partaking of the Lord's Supper, but staying focused on the death of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 27. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning at verse 27. Whoever therefore eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. And so here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and, and 27 to 32, Paul points out to him, when you come together to partake of the Lord's Supper, you need to be focused on the death of Christ. You need to be remembering the death of Christ. If one's not having the proper focus, they partake in an unworthy manner and eat, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Verse number 29. And so when we come together, how do we take part in the Lord's Supper? Well, we take part by not only partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine, but by focusing on the Lord's death. How do we, how do we partake in worship? Well, we partake in giving by giving, but not just giving, giving as we've purposed in our hearts. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 now. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at verse 6. This is probably the most familiar passage to us when it comes to giving. 1 Corinthians 9, beginning at verse 6. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided or purposed in his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. So how is it we give? What is our attitude to giving? Well, we, we, we purpose in our hearts before we give. That is, we don't just give. We, there's a purpose of heart that takes place. It's not just I write a check and I drop it in the plate as I walk by, but we purpose in our hearts. This is something we've decided. Okay, It's not, oh, well, I forgot. I've got to give. And uh, let me see. What have I got in my wallet? Well, how, how big a check can I write? Day. Well, what can I do? It, it's a purpose. It's a deciding in the heart beforehand. Right? That's what's taking place if we're taking of the Lord's Supper. It's not just deciding in the heart. It's giving not reluctantly or under compulsion. That is, okay, I'll write the check. I've decided what I'm going to write, and I've, or I'll write a check, but I'm, I'm kind of hesitant to let let this check go. That's for, you, We're not to be reluctant. Or I'll write the check out of it in, but then I said, well, I have written that. It's not reluctantly or under compulsion. Instead, it's a cheerful giver. Remember that what you give is, is given to spread the force of the kingdom. It's given to support those that preach and teach the gospel and to help the local work uh, there continue. And so God says we need to be cheerful. We need to give as we've decided in our heart. We need to give not reluctantly nor of compulsion. Now, not only can we partake, uh, in worship by focusing on the Lord's death and giving as we purpose in our hearts, we can uh, partake in services by following along with the preacher. Go to Acts 17. Acts 17 and in verse 11. Uh, here is the commending of the, Bereans, the noble or fair-minded or noble-minded Bereans. And it says in the scriptures that these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily. Listen to the last half to see if the things that were taught were so. How do we partake in worship services with the preacher? We can partake by following along. So when we say go to this passage here, you can turn to that passage uh, and follow along. Maybe you take notes with what the preacher's saying so you can go back and look at them later on. There are several ways we can partake, but we need to be taking part. We need to be following along what's being said so we can be taking part instead of having our mind somewhere else. And we need to partake in services by following along with the preacher. We need to follow along in services by praying from the heart. Go to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14 and in verse 15. 
Uh, Paul here in 1 Corinthians 14 is dealing with some problems they have concerning spiritual gifts. And the fact there's some confusion going on because uh, they're, they're, there seems to be multiple standing up and speaking at the same time. That seems to be the problem here in 1 Corinthians 14. And this is when he talks later on about things being decently and in order. But he said, uh, too, that what happens is in verse 13, Therefore one may speak in a tongue, should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So I'm praying in a tongue, uh, and I'm praying in my tongue, but my mind's unfruitful. I'm not really focused. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Is prayer coming from the heart? There's a problem in Matthew chapter 6 that Jesus condemns. The problem is not. I think sometimes we get confused. The problem in Matthew chapter 6 is not repetition in prayer. That is not the problem. I think sometimes we think that that's the problem. The problem is they have, they're repeating and they're, they're, they're being repetitive in their prayers and that's the problem. That's not the problem. The problem is they're being repetitive for the sake of being repetitive. They're using many words for the sake of many words and their heart is not in it. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus condemns them because here they are praying to God, but they don't have the proper mindset or the proper heart. Well, when we're praying, we need to pray from the heart. Whether we're the one leading in prayer or we're listening to the one leading in prayer, uh, keep this in mind. They're not praying. They're leading us in prayer. I think that's something we get confused on sometimes. Well, so and so, so, so earlier Trenton said a prayer for us. Well, Trenton said a prayer, and so Trenton's the one saying it, and then we may be off somewhere else. No, he's leading us in prayer. We need to be listening to what he says. Right? As he's praying, he's the one leading us in prayer. Just like when Mike gets up here and leads us in singing later on, we're going to follow along. Now, we're not repeating what Trenton's saying, but we're listening and following along because he's leading us in prayer, just like Mike is leading us in singing. And we need to stay focused and make sure that our hearts are in the right place and focused on what is being said and not somewhere else. We partake in prayer by having praying from the heart and by focusing on what is being said. And then finally, we sing. Ephesians 5.19, we've read it already, addressing one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Is our heart behind the singing that we do? When we open up a song, the song book, or I guess look on the screen now, and we look at the song that's being sung, are we following along? And so we sing a song like the last mile of the way. I'm singing the word. I'm singing if I walk in the pathway of duty. I'm singing if I work till the close of the day. But my mind is somewhere else. Where am I going to go for lunch today? Or what am I going to fix for lunch today? I wonder what's going to happen in the ball game this afternoon. Or maybe you come this evening and we sing. I wonder what happened in that, oh, what is it, 445 kickoff this afternoon. I wonder what's going on in that game. Is our mind focused where it needs to be? Or is it somewhere else? I may be saying the words. But is my heart focused where it needs to be? Do I have my heart in the right place when it comes to worshiping God? We need to be partaking part in worship by focusing here in the Lord's Supper, by having a purpose of heart when we give, and by giving cheerfully and not grudgingly. We need to follow along with the preacher. We need to pray from the heart and follow along with the one leading us in prayer. And when we sing, we sing from the heart. Not just singing the words, but singing it and understanding what it means and with me. Yet, you might go somewhere. And perhaps you go somewhere and you may find, maybe you're not, maybe if you could fly on the wall and observe things, you might find people that during the Lord's Supper are just distracted. Oh, they'll take of the bread, they'll take of the fruit of the vine, and then they're clearly not focused on the Lord's death. They're clearly sort of off in la la land over here wondering about something else. And maybe the focus is not where it needs to be. And so we're distracted during the Lord's Supper. You know what that's not? That's not taking part as we ought to be. Yeah, we took the bread, we took the fruit of the vine, but we're not taking part as we ought to be. Or maybe you see somebody that gives, maybe you saw the person that sort of hesitated to drop the check in the collection plate as they walked by. Oh, they gave. And there's all the proper acts there, but it wasn't with purpose of heart. It was it was sort of it, it wasn't uh, not grudgingly, it was grudgingly as they let the check go. Or maybe you say someone that sits there and isn't focused on what the preacher's saying, or focused on what the one leading a Bible study is saying, or focused on what 
one uh, leading an invitation is saying, and instead, it, it, not following along with their Bible or taking notes or even listening intently, but they're sort of off over here in the distance thinking about something else. Maybe if you were a fly on the wall, you could observe that. Maybe if you could get in someone's mind, you could see that. that there are people that are not following along as they need to. Or maybe, again, if you're a fly on the wall, please do not look around and see if other people are distracted later on. Please stay focused. But if you can be a fly on the wall and observe, you might see somebody distracted during prayer who's not focused on the prayer, but you can tell is clearly off somewhere else in their mind. Or maybe not singing along or singing along but sort of just moving their lips and there's clearly no heart. There's clearly no, no purpose in what they're saying. They're just sort of saying the words because they need to say the words. Perhaps if you're a fly on the wall, you might observe these things. People distracted during the Lord's Supper. People giving but without thinking. People not following along with the teaching and preaching of the gospel. People not focused on during prayer. People not singing along or when they are, they're just moving their mouth. And you know what you're finding? You're finding people whose participation is lacking. You might find, when you go into a church, you might find a lack of participation at worship services. Yes, we're all concerned about the things that we can see that are wrong. That shouldn't be there. But sometimes we need to be concerned about the things we, that are not there. That ought to be. And you might find at worship services a lack of everyone's presence. A lack of everyone's participation. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> of everyone's participation. And finally, you might find a lack of everyone's best effort. This ties closely back to what we've already said about participation. This plays a part, but there's other things to consider as well besides just one's participation in services. Let's begin by understanding this principle. God demands, God demands that we give of our best. Look at Luke chapter 21. A couple of passages to look at. Luke chapter 21 beginning. In Luke 21 beginning at verse 1, Jesus said, it says, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. Here's a woman giving her best. In fact, she's literally giving it her all. Everything she has in service to God, because that's what is most important. That's what's most important when it comes to service to God, is giving our best. I want you to think about Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1 in the passage that Cole read for us earlier in Malachi 1. Coming down, skip down into verse 8 of Malachi 1. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those who are lame or sick, is that not evil? Here's the problem of Malachi's day. The people are not giving, well, give, and they're not giving of their best. Now I want you to think about pre-exile Judah and Israel for just a minute. And then we're going to come to the post-exilic uh, prophets and, and what's happening in Malachi's day. Pre-exile, here was the problem. The problem was the people were worshiping idols. That was the big problem. Uh, you may remember, they're, they're passing through the fires to Molech. Israel had Baal worship. Uh, Israel had calves at Dan and Bethel. Again, Jerusalem and Molech. Jerusalem having all these other images they may uh, erect to worship there. And so the problem of the exile is they're worshiping other gods. Violent that command, you shall have no other gods before me, and thou image. That's the pre-exile problem. Then they go into exile, right? That's where Ezekiel and Daniel takes place. And then they learn, some of them at least, a lesson or a partial lesson in that. Some still had idols in their heart. I believe it's Ezekiel chapter 8 or 14, where the, one of the times that the elders read of, of Ezekiel, that they, it said they have idols in their heart. But most of those people learned their lesson and came back. And you know what they do not have in the, in the post-exilic prophet? They do not have the same idols they had before. Right? There's no mole. There's no passing the child through the fire taking place. That's not the problem. Here is the problem. They're worshiping God and not giving of their best to God. That's why in verse 8, he says, when you offer the blind animals is it a sac in sacrifice, is that not evil? Okay, so here you come in a sacrifice, but I've got this good lamb over 
here. I'm not going to give that. That's that's going to cost me too much. I'm going to give this one over here that's that that's blind. Or I'm going to give this one over here that's lame. Or I'm going to give this one over here that's sick. Later on, it's going to be mentioned in some moment they're giving. It to God. That's not sacrifice. That's the point that Malachi is making. The problem isn't that they're not worshiping God. They're worshiping God. They're not worshiping Him by giving their best effort. So they're giving the lame, the sick, and the blind. Look, following that in verse 7. Present, present this to your governor. You're going to give a gift to your governor? Give him that. Give him the lame. Give him the sick. Give him the blind. Will he accept you or show you favor? Says the Lord of hosts. What if you give that to your governor? Is he going to take that sacrifice from your hands? You're, you're not giving it over here to God. Give it to your governor. What's the governor going to say? And now entreat the favor of God, that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Is it What he's saying now in verse number 9 is, now entreat the favor of God. Will you entreat the favor of the governor with that sacrifice? The answer is no. It's implied no. No. Now entreat the favor of God. How are you going to do that? By not giving those sacrifices. With such a favor, and will he show any favor to you? Are you going to entreat the favor with those sacrifices? Again, the answer is no. Verse 10. Oh, that there was one among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. Says, That's what you want to bring to me. I just wish there was somebody that would shut the door. Because all you're doing is kindling fire on the altar in vain. It's not true worship because you're not giving your best. Oh yeah, we're giving the lamb like it says give the lamb. We're not giving the best like it's demanded of us. That's the problem taking place here in Malachi. Now, I want us to consider the fact that while we may not be offering sacrifices of lamb, that there are some areas in which when they're lacking, we're not giving our best effort. It is not giving our best effort when we are not focused on God's worship. Now, we've already talked about this some, but I want us to understand this point. If my mind is on something other than God, it's not giving my best. If my mind is focused on self, or my mind is focused on recreational activities, or my mind is focused on others, it's not giving my best to God. It's not giving my of our best when we are ready to get out of services. When we're ready for the preacher to just end, we're ready for the final prayer to happen in so we can get up and we can get out. That's not giving our best. God demands the best that we have. It is not giving of our best. If our goal is to be here so people see us here and we did what we had to do so we can check it off the list and then we can get out the door. What God's reaction is, I wish someone would just shut the doors so you would not worship me in vain. Is it giving our best? And it is not. When we view worship as casual, when we've come to no longer be worship as a time to come and show reverence and respect to the Almighty God, that's not giving of our best if that's our view of worship. Oh, well, well, it's, it's just something we do. Again, checking it off the list. And we've come to view it like everything else we do in a week. If we've come to view worship as God, and that's become a problem. That's why you see so many of these changes we said earlier shouldn't be taking place. It's because worship is becoming more and more casual. Well, we don't want it to feel out of people to feel out of place, and so we're going to make it more and more casual so people feel more comfortable. That's what's taking place in many places. Listen, if we're treating worship as casual and not treating it as worship to the Almighty God, then we're not giving our best. We're not giving our best if we dress so casual for worship that it looks like we're dressing for anything else. God demands we give our best. And if we're dressed so casual that you can't tell the difference between worship services and passing us in the store on Monday, are we truly giving our best to God? It's not giving our best if we've come to dress so casual for worship. It's not giving our best if giving just feels like it costs too much. 
that it's time to let the check go. It's hard to let the check go. I feel like there's too many sacrifices I have to make, not just in giving uh, uh, and laying by in store, but, but, but giving as in uh, giving of my time costs me too much. It's too much for me to go to worship God. It's too much for me to spend time doing this to God. Not just in worship services, but even in our everyday life, it just costs me too much to serve God. I've got other things to do. That's not giving our best effort. And finally... It's not giving our best effort when we just give God our leftovers. Well, now that everything else is done, I've got a little bit of time. I can swing by services for a little bit. Well, now that I've taken care of all the things I want to take care of, now I can give God God on the first day. It's not giving of our best. When what we come to give God is our leftovers. I want you to think about with all these things, the question that is asked in Malachi's day. In Malachi chapter 1 and in verse 8, present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor? Says the Lord of hosts. Now, what if I'm going to listen to the speech from somebody, some some well-known politician? Maybe I'm going to listen to the governor. I'm going to listen to a senator or somebody in a speech. How would they feel if they found out that the whole time I was sitting there, I wasn't focused, listening to anything they said? Here they are giving their big speech. My mind's off over here. They're probably not going to be too pleased. They might not care. But then again, maybe they're hoping to listen to what they have to say. What if I come to, to uh, listen to somebody who is uh, some politician and I get ready to come to see them and I dress, would I dress the same way? for worship services? Or maybe I would feel like I need to dress up a little bit and shake the hand of the president. Ah, maybe I should dress up a little bit. What if I said, I'll give you some time, just let me take care of everything else I want to do, and then I'll, I'll, I'll you know, what if, what if the campaign manager for a senator said, well, I'll, I'll run your campaign after I do everything I want to do, and then I'll just sort of give you the five minutes I've got left at the end of the day. They're probably not going to be very happy. I'll tell you what, those people have power on earth. Power, by the way, that as Jesus points out, comes from God. But I bring that up to say that what we're doing today, what we're coming back tonight to do at 6 o'clock, what we're going to do on Wednesday evening at 7, is we're coming together to worship. Not a president, not a senator, not a governor, not some man. We're worshiping the creator of all the world. The one who gave his son for us. When we're partaking of the Lord's Supper, we're remembering that sacrifice. When we're giving, oh, it may be a check we write, but it's far less than what He gave for us. When we come together to worship, we're worshiping the Almighty God. He demands our best. Listen carefully. He not only demands, He deserves our best. There is nothing Nothing we can give that is too much for the one that created us and gave his son for us. Yeah, you might go to some places and you might find that all of those things we just said shouldn't be part or or, are not giving our best. You might see every one of them. People not focused, people ready viewing it as a casual dress, give it feeling like giving costs too much, and people you give God their leftovers. You might find that in many places. In fact, when it comes to worship, let's understand this. You might find a lack of everyone's best effort. I'm not saying nobody's given their best effort. I'm saying you might go to a place and find that not everybody is giving their best effort. There are some things that we might find, some things you might find lacking at services. You might not find everyone's presence. You might not find everyone. Uh, you might not find everyone participating. <coughs> Excuse me. And you might not find everyone giving their best effort. And we can't control what everyone else does. But do remember this. I can control me. And so perhaps you look at yourself and realize, maybe I need to do better. Maybe I'm not going to service and just finding those things lacking. Maybe I'm finding that as I look at myself, they're lacking in my own life. And then we need to take care of it. Because God deserves our best. There are some things lacking in services. But may it not be lacking 
because of us. As we come to a close this morning, it may be that there's one or more present who may have never responded in obedience to the gospel. Perhaps you're here now that you've, and you've heard the word of God and you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You realize that you're lost in your sins. Now what you need to do is to repent of those sins, to confess your faith in Him, and to be buried in the waters of baptism, rising up to walk in the newness of life, having your sins forgiven. And now you can offer worship to the Almighty God, the Creator that deserves our best. Maybe you're here and you realize somewhere along the line you've not given God your best, either in your worship or maybe in your life as a whole. You've just not given your best and done what you ought to do. If it's a sin of a private nature, you can take it to the Lord privately in prayer. But if it's a sin of a public nature or you would desire the prayers of the congregation, then we'll gladly pray with you and for you for God to forgive you. But no matter what your need is, if you're here this morning and we can assist you in any way, would you not come forward as together we stand and as we sing?